let's just start at the top. Can you explain to us what is um, what is this service? What is this brand? Yeah, the, the fabric is a rebranding of Azure Synapse, and it's essentially a service that encompasses all of the necessary services you would need to use to build out a data and analytics platform. Yeah, and I think Fabric is also, you know, it's it's incorporating multiple services inside of uh, the Azure framework that are used in concert with each other to develop analytic solutions, right? And those solutions could be for um, just, you know, traditional analytics, also set up stuff for machine learning and potentially storing data and getting ready for uh, using that data to train AI models as well. So th th those are the primary things, but Fabric was, is this, is is kind of a, a overarching service that's going to incorporate multiple things that are almost always used in conjunction and concert with each other to accomplish these types of projects. So this what I'm hearing is this isn't something new. So the idea of the concept of fabric is new, right? The idea that all of these kind of being together and being able to purchase and bundle those together, the per of being able to purchase them together is new. But the idea of the services, individual services aren't necessarily all new. One component is though the the one lake, is that what's it called? Uh, yeah. Right? One That's lake. Right. Yeah, yeah. One lake is a new uh, emerging service from Microsoft. One lake is their competitor, if you will, to a Databricks. It's more of, if you get into technical terms, it's more of your ability to write, to interact with unstructured data, be able to generate notebooks and, and scripts against that, uh, uh, against those data sets. So it's, uh, I guess at the, at the very highest level, it's the underlying engine gives users the ability to interact with files and create deltas so I can make updates to that file. I can delete from that file, which was not something they had in the past. You know, files are typically dumb, if you will. So yeah. who are you working with when your clients or your potential clients come to you and they start asking you about service fabric? Yeah, more Those business individuals. People. Yeah. 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 Because I wanted to spark conversation because this is new. Yeah. And a lot of people haven't implemented it yet. And most of the conversations we're getting are what is this? Should I be using it? I don't, you know, trying to understand what fabric is as a whole. Yeah. Okay. Where does it fit in? Is it better? Yeah. What's different about it? What, you know, what Microsoft's really pushing this? What do I need to know about it? Okay. That, that, that and then migrating to fabric. You right. already have an ecosystem in place. What do I need to do to leverage fabric? If I already have, if I'm already using some of those services that Chris mentioned that make up under that fabric ecosystem, those are the two main drivers of the conversation. Yeah. Okay, that, that's good. That sort of sets up to the, the <clears> next <throat> question. Um, you know, you guys initially talked a lot about analytics. Uh, how does this, you know, for the layperson, how does this relate to um, the current system, Microsoft Analytics system that that a customer would have in place? Um, and yeah, how does that how does that all relate? Most of the services, like Christian, Chris mentioned before. Uh, if they have an existing uh, analytical uh, Azure based infrastructure architecture in place, they're already leveraging a lot of the same services that sit under the fabric umbrella. So this is really Microsoft's attempt to get everything consolidated into one area. So it makes you, it makes it easier for you to know what services I need to use and leverage to be able to build out you know, this analytics platform. Yeah. And this is, this is the, the next step forward though in technology, right? Like this is, this is mostly cloud native cloud uh, tools, cloud services that are cloud native too. Um, so this is people moving beyond the traditional approach to analytics and starting to adopt these newer technologies that have emerged in the last few years and these new processes and new ways to process the data, you know, organize the data, clean it, standardize it, use it, use it in analytics, machine learning, AI, those types of things. So it's kind of a step forward and it's really this package is trying to help people get their arms around what pieces to use, especially if you're a lay person, you're not gonna understand that I've gotta get this and then use this and this and this and string those things together. That's not gonna really be evident to people. Um, and so this is this is it, it, getting it all on one umbrella and putting it all into this one piece. So you can kind of say that um, Microsoft's problem 
And then your client's problem is kind of the same solution that there are a ton of separate parts in the Microsoft ecosystem services yeah. in, the, in yeah. the Microsoft services. Um, Microsoft recognizes it. The client knows it, that it feels like it's getting too complicated. And uh, this is their solution to package it and make it all work better together. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Okay. That, that's true. Great. Um, just so I can do my due diligence here, because my questions were based off of uh, search research. Um, so if you could specifically answer, um, how is Fabric different than the Azure Synapse Analytics? I know you've already said that, but if you could just kind of formulate it, like answer that like specific question. Synapse is one service that sits inside of Azure as a whole and Fabric encompasses a lot of services. So Synapse is one service that sits under the Fabric umbrella and it is the storage portion of it, the database storage portion, portion of it. It also has many other services as well, but you could just spin up and leverage Synapse independent of Fabric. Mm. But now they're trying to get you to the point where you're leveraging all of the analytical services that they deem you would use under that one Fabric umbrella. So if that answers the question. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, what does it look like for, oops, what does it look like for the person who's, uh, they've already implemented Synapse and, they, and they're considering what it would look like to move to uh, this this greater piece of technology or this greater kind of service, um, you know, specifically, you know, the question about using integrating existing workloads. Um, can you kind of answer that for the person who is already using Synapse looking to expand? Yeah, there's a there's a migration process. And I think that's, you know, we've had a lot of customers reaching out to us saying that exact thing. I have data factory jobs, I have Synapse, how do I leverage uh fabric and our answer is in some cases because of the newer services that are fall under the fabric umbrella there might be better and newer ways to do what you're doing today we might still leverage synapse in some capacity but due to one lake and the, the notebook portion of things and be able to interact with semi-structured and unstructured data um, we can definitely leverage synapse because that's a part of the services that fall under that umbrella but because there's also additional services that expand on your ability to interact with data, there might be slight re-architecture that helps cost mitigate and, and increase the speed of which you consume and, and process data and present cool. it. Give us a, one or two examples maybe of uh, of how you moved from moved someone from Synapse and integrated into, into the greater fabric. There's this idea, Sam, of moving beyond the traditional database, right? Mm -hmm. A traditional relational database, um, and which Synapse is a kind of uh, is that, right, to some extent, and moving into these newer technologies, right? So One Lake and uh, Databricks and these other pieces are are a, a little bit of a different and newer technology that can also help do what what those databases were used for it can process a lot of data it can be the source for those data it can imply structure to it and then be used for reporting analytics machine learning predictions uh ai all of those types of things and so at times there there are good reasons from a performance or cost perspective to move them mm -hmm. from some you know synapse which is a more of a traditional approach to some of these newer technologies because it's either going to be faster, it can process more, it could be potentially cheaper, um, it can be, add a little bit more flexibility into the processes they're trying to do, or it has other extensions that they're seeking to use. So sometimes they will stay in one, um, and other times, you know, there, there, there's reasons, there's a compelling reason to move into this newer technology. That's great. Yeah, I like, uh, I think you touched on quite a few things there. Chad, do you have anything to add? No, I think it's, I mean, I, I I would talk about approach, but I think he's correct. I mean, when you're looking at Synapse, you're thinking about uh, notebooks, and he mentioned One Lake, and he mentioned Gen 2 Storage, and those are the two big services that would play into you migrating off of a what like an older style technology of leveraging Synapse and getting more into building out pipelines and storage and leverage leveraging Gen 2 and and uh, One Lake like formation so yeah so just briefly educate me how old of a product or service is uh is synapse it's, i think it, it 
Yeah. I think it was relatively new. I think it's okay. not relatively new. I think it was um, it was quickly one of the first services that existed within Azure. Exactly. I don't know exactly when, okay. but but it's it's SQL Server essentially in the in the cloud, um, and they have physical VMs you can spin up and install SQL Server on. But it was I think Azure one of the first things they wanted to do was to okay. get a scalable version of that SQL Server. So here's why I asked that. It, and so um, Chris. You know, you. I think you touched on some really good of the, the kind of the business end cases uh, of why to consider this migration, um, or you know, kind of evolution into it into uh, fabric. But is this? It, would it be fair to say that you know, if you are uh, if you are concerned of how your current infrastructure um, is going to survive in the next five years? Is this kind of like a, a a simple step in the right direction, uh, where it's like we can't we we can't completely reinvent the wheel, but by moving more into the the um, service fabric, especially if you if you're coming from like the Synapse world, is it kind of like an intermediate step, almost like a necessary step to to make sure that you're staying. Yeah, it's just the evolution of technology, right? You're just kind of moving towards the latest kind of greatest stuff. So Synapse still has value and is still applicable in certain situations. It's just not kind of that. There's an, a, a new step above that one now that's kind of emerging out as a, as a way to do these things. There was some evidence that people are comparing Fabric to Databricks and Snowflake. Um, just talk to us a little bit specifically about how those three things are are competitive and relate. Fabric is really, and Microsoft in general is really pushing hard to try to to mimic the Databricks architecture. It's been very successful mm -hmm. in in being able to um, consume semi structured and unstructured data, which more and more organizations are are dealing with on a daily basis. Um, and so, the cost structure for Synapse and being able to interact with external tables and data that are files was very costly and slow. And so this is their first foray into building that same kind of backend Spark engine, Spark pooling that mimics what Databricks does so that the cost is a little bit more in line with what Databricks and Snowflake can do. Um, and so they're able to, uh, they're, Microsoft as a whole is able to produce through one lake the your ability to leverage notebooks and, and scripts to be able to interact with with those semi-structured and unstructured data. The one big difference between I think Databricks and Snowflake and versus Fabric is the latter two are uh, platform independent. So you can run them in multiple environments where uh, Fabric, you're you know you're locked in to just Azure. Uh, the the pricing part of it is a little hard because it's really difficult. Fabric's relatively new, so I think people are still trying to wrap their head around just what the pricing structure looks like compared to a Databricks. But just looking at workloads and trying to compare, it seems like they're all relatively cl close in price. I think Azure still kind of sits at the top of that, um, but they're getting really close to being able from an architecture perspective produce the same type of outputs that fabric i mean that uh databricks and, and snowflake can produce so would you have had uh clients where they have all they're using a lot of microsoft services or microsoft products and in the past have not been able to integrate them as well like as you pointed out azure uh synapse i mean is to be able to to use that to to connect to some of these other things, just it, you said it was costly. Um, would using something like Snowflake or Databricks been a solution, uh, an un, maybe an unnecessary, uh, uh, unwanted, but a real solution to integrating some of those Microsoft products, where now Microsoft is offering its own native way to doing of doing what? Again, if you are very Microsoft based, doing what? Uh, you would have had to go to Databricks or to yeah. Snowflake to do. Okay. Yeah, I mean, um, Data Factory is a big service that's leveraged in data movement, and Data Factory can be very costly. And I think a lot of organizations are starting to realize that maybe these on-prem pipelines that they had built in the past 
were much cheaper because it's installed on a physical database and they're just paying to use that piece of software. But now that they're seeing these data factory jobs working, uh, they're, I, Microsoft is recognizing that you can do a lot of that in, in Databricks and offload a lot of those costs. So they are creatively trying to, I think, mimic what that architecture looks like in Databricks for that Makes very sense. reason. Yeah. Um, so can you give me any uh, any examples of situations where you've had a client, they've, they've basically, they had a, a they had an environment that was kind of wired together, um, you know, a bunch of Microsoft products using something like Databricks or Snowflake um, that you were, that you could kind of share the example of how you took them from that and, and applied uh, service fabric that resulted in a cost savings. The, the, biggest, the biggest example of cost savings is going to um, get away from Synapse. The way we cost mitigate a lot is to not leverage, uh, is to is to try to cut down on the amount of time that one of these pooling pieces is is exists. So the big architecture that exists in Databricks is I only spin up when I need to when I need to serve data to you, and I spin back down. Synapse is is takes longer to to spin up, and it stays running longer, and then it spins down, and so you're acquiring more costs due to fabric being implemented, they now have the ability to mimic that same type of process that you can do in Databricks. So we're able to leverage one lake and create these same notebooks. So we could migrate essentially the same logic over and half from Databricks, leverage one lake to, to get them from having to leverage Synapse because that's the biggest cost savings that we can we can utilize, right? Yeah. So now the pooling becomes in, a, in effect and we can spin things up and down and help mitigate cost. Chris, do you have anything to add to that? Oh, I think that's exactly right. Like is, you know, one of the tenants in the cloud is uh, is to try and mitigate costs over time. And since you're billing, you're, you're pre-purchasing or you're getting billed monthly, any amount of money you can save in the near term propagates itself over the long term, right? Month to month to month. Yeah. So you're really trying to figure out to get first off on a, on a continuum of you need to get done what you need to get done. So you have to have the right tools to do it, but then how can you get what you need to get done with those tools in the most cost efficient manner, right? So you don't want to overspend, but you don't want to underperform either. So there's a little bit of a balance and tweak there to get everything dialed up. So that's always the consideration is how can you cost mitigate? So can you give us any can you give us any specific examples again not using names but uh, maybe uh, industries where you've worked and 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 actually have and have done walked a client through this process yeah and, I mean, and what one, was the, specifically like what was the result yeah I mean one specific is that we started adopting these new technologies in the cloud they were in a traditional kind of database kind of situation and we moved migrated in the cloud we were able to to uh, you know provide at least a hundred fold of processing power, right? We're cutting times by 20, 20, a magnitude of 20, right? Cutting times down by 20, per, you know, by 20 times faster. And we're also able to um, then not get them into a point where they had to purchase and purchase additional hardware and on-premise, you know, components, put all of this stuff into the cloud, use the later technology, and then turn this whole thing stuff off when they're not using it. So we're just cost wow. mitigating the whole time. Yep. Yeah. So we can take, you know, and not only that, we were able to really of the available data that, you know, people could then use and process, we, we were able to multiply that by three or four fold as well, because the storage costs for data in the cloud is significantly cheaper. I mean, by a, by a magnitude of 100, right? It's not even comparable. It's so much cheaper. And so, um, you know, you, you start getting this into this concept of, well, we could put everything there, right? That has any any potential to be useful, any potential, we use that word, because um, you don't always know exactly what you need, but some data has potential for, for use, right? So keep that available. And um, if there's a use case for it, it's it's there. And now you can yeah. start, you know, uh, readily adopting it. So, yeah, and I, and, and this is like a, I think, struggle kind of with technology in general. The solutions are all the same, right? Yeah, there's a but lot. What you're theoretically, doing, yeah, 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 yeah. What you're doing for your clients is you're you're doing the same thing over and over. But yes. when when 
when a client's coming to you, you know, generally speaking, in, in, to some degree, they're thinking that their situation is unique. Yeah. Um, every time. So every time, exactly. And, um, you know, one of the things, one of my goals for this piece of content is to include some examples um, of, you know, different industries. Let's just call it that way. So that example that you just gave, where, what kind of, what industry was? They're was in the financial in? industry. Yeah. Okay. The financial industry, yeah. Give me an example. Again, don't name the client, but just give me an example of. I got your, several. Yeah, I know. Uh, um, so this customer, which is who I alluded to earlier, they have, they've got 852 data, which is coming from retailers. They got, uh, they've got purchase order data. They've got, uh, we got to look at stock statuses and they had, basically the gist of the problem was that they outsourced all of their data and analytics to another organization who consumed all their information and generated reports for them. And so we had the task of basically re-engineering how they consume data. You know, at first it was, if, if you're familiar with 852s and the EDI process, that's a kind of a, a difficult thing to even change how we, we get data, but there, everything's file-based and nothing is sits in a physical database where they were in a physical database before so um we don't have any physical servers it's all SaaS. so we're ingesting data all day long i mean it could be purchase order data from retailers it could be 852 data coming in and then we are using um uh azure's environment to store that in gen 2 and we are exposing it in power bi and uh, the majority of that process is all done through scripting. You know, we're not using any physical SQL tables. If you request data, the engine spins up, serves that request, spins back down. So that gets us into the cost mitigation side of things. Um, because obviously the longer services are running, the more you're paying for them. That's how Azure yeah. obviously makes money. So our goal is to do all of the processing and the ETL logic as fast as possible, right? Yeah. Um, so the, the 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 biggest underlying problem for them was trying to try to get out of the current day minus one. They were always getting data, having to reload a cube. If Chris can tell you, refreshing a cube, which is a, a bunch of outdated technology, can take 10 to 12 hours. And if you have any sort of updates to that, you're having to wait till the next day for the cube to refresh again mm. versus our architecture can can consume any data at any time, uh, 24 hours a day. So as real time as they want it, we can we can provide it, which was a so, big plus for them. And in that case, in that example, um, you weren't just saving time or you weren't just saving money, but you were saving time and, and having a faster deliverability by not having to wait for Correct. To spin up. There was, yeah, there was decisions they want to make midday around stock. You know, do our retailers yeah. have enough stock on hand? Right. Yeah. So those decisions couldn't be made and, and they were in a vacuum at the time, you know? So, wow. Yeah. I mean, that's, th there's the problem. There's, there's the tangible thing um, that, yeah. I mean, then you have some, you have a, a VP who's antsy because know that somebody needs answers and, it's my job to essentially get them answers and I'm having to wait for a piece of technology that that's just spinning, literally spinning and, and wasting my time and making me look bad. Yeah. Yeah. Um, cool. Um, we've touched on quite a lot of these, especially, uh, um, we've got on into a lot of the technical side. Uh, I'm just, I'm just going through my questions here to see if there's something, um, the security came up quite a few times. Um, the question, the way it was asked, at least uh, in, in search, was something around how do you implement security within service fabric applications? Tell me if that question even makes sense. And if it doesn't, what's wrong about the question? And then answer the right question. No, it does. I mean, when you when you think about data and analytics, typically PII data is not something that you report on. PII data is personally identifiable information, yep. social security numbers, yep. that's, that doesn't have analytical potential. So a lot of times if we're extracting data from an API or from a, a source that has PII data in it, it's encrypted in transit, it's encrypted at rest in Gen 2 storage. So you, you know Azure itself provides that type of security. Okay. 
Um, and then as we move through the, the lineage of the ecosystem of, before we present it to the user, we have stripped out all of that PII data and only push through what had analytical potential. But then as you get into the presentation layer, you know, Power BI, we can start to control if you log in, which is the same type of security model that's been around for decades. You know, who can see what? And certain users can't see certain reports. Certain users can't see certain data elements inside a report. And so depending on what kind of security we're, we're talking about, if it's just the data itself, then Azure does a great job of encrypting that at rest and keeping that at, at bay so people can't can't uh, hack you, but then from a consumption perspective, there's a lot we can do inside of Power BI to help mitigate what users can and can't see. What which would you call role level security or object level security? Yeah, Chris, anything to add on the security side? Yeah, no, I mean, and, and you know, Azure's a hardened uh, system itself, right? So we're we're working within their general guidelines of of uh, how how they. Uh, ideally set up a security posture. So we're doing best practices inside of Azure. Now, and since Fabric kind of self-deploys, they, they have a lot of the of the security components already built into it. So um, it's, it, you know, people may even actually trust it a little bit more because they are physically deploying all these services under one big umbrella. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> they're, they're probably handling a lot of it rather than us setting it up as we go. They're, they're handling a lot of that internally. So you, you said you, Use the phrase self-deployed. Can you explain yeah. what that means? Yeah. When so when you go out and, and spin up a new fabric environment, it's it's kind of deploying the services and setting up the environment for you. So before we were taking all of these components and putting them together, you know, think of little Legos and we were stacking them into a little block, right? But now they just give you the block. It's still got the Legos there, but they just give you the block pre-assembled. So because they're deploying it themselves, they've already strung and, and pieced them all together and got all the communication and, and things to work their way. And just to add one more thing to that. Yeah, go ahead. Um, a part of the fabric security, I think that is, becomes more and more um, discussed is governance. And so yeah. built into that, until their ecosystem, they've got data lineage which is a big thing, you know, as something changes in the source, what kind of impacts does that have downstream on my reports? And they've got uh, data loss prevention, I think, and uh, uh, something called purview integration I was reading. This uh, things that sit within that ecosystem that, because yeah. to your point, security is, is, a, is a huge, huge yeah. thing across all conversations that we have. But I think as the cloud becomes more and more relevant and more and more people are in it, they're becoming more used to the fact that everything is secure, you know, once you're in that ecosystem. Because obviously Azure, they can't afford not to be, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> Probably going to be some business side of the, the, the coin person out there who's thinking, you know, who hasn't migrated to the cloud yet, um, or maybe has just a little bit begrudgingly uh, I think that's probably behind the idea, maybe behind the questions as far as um, data persistence, reliability, uh, things like that. Um, obviously, some of that kind of relates to security, but can you talk about those things? Like, why would you migrate to the cloud? I mean, essentially, that is that's that's okay. kind of. I mean, the big one for us is speed. You know, a lot of companies come to us and they they have this problem that they want us to solve. And if you're not going to give me a cloud environment to try to solve that problem, the amount of time it's going to take for you to spin up services, spin up yeah. hardware on-prem, you know, give us VPN access, install that locally. You give us one login to an Azure environment and we can POC something in a matter of days, maybe in the same What's day. POC? Proof of, of concept. concept. Proof yeah. of concept. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. That's we, right. can proof, we can prove something out for you really quickly, which is a lot, of, which is how we start a lot of our engagements. You know, customers come to us and they're listening to what we're saying. And, you know, to your point, Sam, you understand 50% of what I say. I got to do a better job for you, of you to understand 100%. But I, a lot of it is, let us just show you. Let That's me great. show you how quickly I can produce some output and, and potentially solve your problem on a very small scale that we can we can expand out over time. We're um, we're proofing a business use case, right? We're we're yeah. proving the out speed that, of, yeah the speed of which we can proof out a business case or a use case or a problem is tenfold yeah. compared to on you know trying to leverage on prem environment. 
Yeah, mm-hmm. most like Chet said, most of the time people have a use case. They're like, I need to do this, these things better, faster, right? Yeah. Stronger, more accurately, uh, cheaper, whatever. Like insert all of these things. And so it's easy to kind of come in and say, okay, we, we feel like these technology pieces in these this set would be your ideal situation. We've done it over here, here, and here. We have all of these, you know, we know we know and prove this out, but we'll take your your specific case, your use case, and mm-hmm. proof it as as quickly as possible, right? Come up with the minimal piece to say, yep, see what we told you, this is gonna work. We should go full speed with that. And then, so the very last question on there, because I feel like it's somewhat, well, I think it is, it's it's related, um, but let's talk about specifically, how does uh, Fabric relate to Microsoft's use of AI? So this is a sort of a forward thinking question um, for the person who's kind of thinking in that mindset. I mean, I, I feel like in one use case in Chad, you can say another, but the one use case is, is is people that are interested in AI and wanting to know how AI can be applicable to them in their organization, in their process, in their, you know, what they're potentially wanting to use AI for. The framework within uh, Fabric is going to set them up because the best some of the best the AI needs training data, right? And the best data is your data, right? And so having that organized in a usable format in a scalable system, you know, laid out in a way that you can help kind of marry a use case for AI and the technology to make that happen. You have the data in a good spot. You have a use case. How can you kind of combine those pieces to use AI to solve that problem? So um, because a lot of times in, in, gen, in things, people are having trouble saying, where, where do I use AI? Where, what, like, right. what, what is this thing that I'm going to use? And so if you're not writing copy or changing pictures or, you know, transcribing things or whatever, right, it, it's kind of saying, will, will AI fix this or not? And, and you have to kind of push in to see, is this a use case that's going to be viable, right? Is it worth your time to do all of the, the plumbing to get that to work? and it have some reasonable outcome with it. So the fabric is, while it's hopefully helping you organize and curate all of the data, real data, your data, um, to maybe set that up for future use with AI solutions that you're going to develop in-house. That's kind of my short answer. Yeah, great. And, and you have, expect- just to okay. clarify before you have to run, Chris, uh, how many of your clients are actually coming to you with with that on their minds? Everybody. Everybody wants to know, but no one, the use cases are, okay, well, we're going to have to kind of try and find some use cases, right? And so, that's yeah, that's, we're, we're seeing a lot of people say, yeah, AI, where were you going to use it? And we're like, well, where, where do you want to use it? And they're like, I don't know. What, you what tell me. Yeah. What are you seeing people do? And it's yeah, just not I mean, applicable. You yeah, know? they're like, well, that's not going to help there. Well, no. you're already using it in, you know, I mean, are you wanting to use large language models? Are you wanting to use machine learning? Are we doing, you know, people in the finance industry are uh, assessing credit risk or buying patterns, stuff like that. Like, those are fairly self-evident ones. But yeah. other ones, um, you know, it's not just readily apparent where people are coming to us and going, we're going to do AI and we're going to do it this way. And you guys help us get the data together. It's not, it's a yeah. cart horse problem that we're really seeing out there. Yeah. The pen- pattern identification one is, is almost a no brainer, but it's more yeah. of the, the generative, what are you creating kind of something out of nothing in a way that. Yeah. Related to AI is in preview mode. So it's not, you know, at fabric is so new and the mm. AI portion of fabric is not, okay. it's not Good out for. Yeah, it's not out for open consumption, but that was the big part of of Fabric is it, it is a data engineering, data science um, ecosystem that will allow you to leverage pre-built AI models, um, you know, to to help drive out, you know, using Python or using any sort of scripting language. That, yeah, that was, that's a big part of what Fabric is trying to accomplish. Well, that and that touches that touches the kind of the question I was getting at, maybe like halfway through the call. Like, is this is this like, you know, if you're going to continue down uh, as a Microsoft environment, is this almost like, you know, if you're not ready to jump dive straight into all the opportunities that are out there, which is just a ridiculous thing in the first place, but is it almost like? You you need to explore this. You need to consider this product as a as kind of like the next step of how you're going to remain competitive as a business, um, and you know specifically in this nebulous era of what what are what is AI, 
how does it actually do what it's doing? What is it actually doing? And how can we turn yeah. it into something that improves our business? If you're wanting, I mean, could you leverage other services inside of Azure to 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 build out AI models? Yes, I, I think they exist, but you're you're absolutely correct. This is an ecosystem that at some point, to Chris's point, AI is, I mean, it, I think it's a lot of smoke. I mean, my most of my golf clubs have AI printed on them, you know, like it's it, it doesn't make any sense. You know, it's not it's just a term that everybody sees and yep. they think that they have to have. And it really it doesn't the amount of money it takes yeah. to just determine a use case. And then to, it's everything around AI is just it, this might work. We just got to see. So yeah. do you want to devote that kind of money to figure this out? I mean, it's it's up to you, but at least the, the fabric ecosystem gives you a playground that if AI or machine learning becomes applicable to you and your organization, you've got a playground to do that in. 